There's also, there's one uh, thing that I want to assail you with before you go, which is I want you and Insup to talk for at least like a minute or two minutes about uh, non-inferential justification via intuition for moral beliefs. Please. Insup, will you explain what you think is going on with um, moral beliefs? I just don't understand the question, dude. What do you mean? Okay, what... Tell us why you think it's true that it's, like, wrong. Or if, if, I'll just let Jack ask you the questions, but just give us your basic account of what makes something wrong. What makes it wrong? Yeah. Isaac's about to start, like, an hour-long conversation. That there's a reason not to do it. Okay, so the reason... Okay, so you say, when you see a kid being tortured, that you're perceiving uh, some kind of moral fact there, right? Yeah, I have a moral experience. Right, so it your belief that killing the kid is wrong is non-inferentially justified by the moral experience, right? Yeah. Okay, Jack, go crazy. Uh, well... Uh, I'm I sorry to I assail just, you. I, I mean, I don't... I think that, um, well... See, I, when you say perceive, I think probably Insup is doesn't actually think it doesn't actually think it's a perceptual relation. No, right? no, I don't. He probably thinks it's an intuition. Yeah, but I, I mean, I said intuition. I, I muddled it with perception, but whatever. I mean, it's non-inferentially justified via intuition. Yeah, I see, can't. I, I, I can't make sense of this whenever I talk to him about it, which is why I'm just asking you if you can while you're here. Well, I I actually think that um, moral beliefs, well, I think moral beliefs are justified by experience in the sense that, see, I think that there's a causal relation. Like, I think there are value properties in the world which are perceived, and so when we ask why you believe something you you just say well that's what i saw right um but there's like a lot of issues so there's a lot of issues that i think would have to be sort of um addressed right first of all why we should prefer a account of values in which it's actually causal rather than intuitionistic right that's one issue right and that's a long discussion uh, another issue is um, whether non-inferential justification makes sense right uh, but then another issue has to do with what does it actually mean to construe moral facts or any type of value fact non-relativistically, right? To say that there's like a fact of the matter about whether X is wrong independently of uh, how those facts are perceived or conceived, right? So if I if I and so those would all be like long discussions, r right? So the ones that are sticking out to me, like the the causal versus intuitionistic thing, is not at the top of my mind. What so the the point about there being some non-relativistic moral fact that I don't understand. I never can comprehend how insup gets there. And then the other one is is the main one. What the heck is non-inferential justification, and how does that make any sense? Like, yeah. Insup, what do you think what, when you say that it's you're non-inferentially justifying those things? Like, can you just like, can you give me like a synonym? Can you just give some explanation of what exactly that is? Well, that I have a that I have a reason to believe it, but that the reason is related to an inference that I made. The reason is the moral perception, or the moral experience, the moral intuition. 
Yeah, well, that's what gives me more reason. And so your intuitions can be wrong, yeah, obviously, right? Yeah. So why are these intuitions not wrong or less likely to be wrong? Well, they're justified. By wait, but you're just saying they're justified by intuition, and I'm calling into question whether how to tell when something that's justified by intuition or when something that's intuited is justified or not, and you're just saying it's intuited, right? But I'm questioning. Oh well, that's wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, that's a that's a false standard, right? You don't know, you don't need to get outside of some belief forming mechanism to prove that the mechanism is reliable, because that would lead to a regress, right? Then you'd have to prove that the mechanism that you used to test the mechanism was reliable. It would go on and on, right? Rather, you're just entitled to um, take things as they appear, unless you have some defeater for them. Um, yeah, what's the word for that? Conservative something? Um, yeah, phenomenal conservative. Right. So how do you distinguish between intuitions that are, uh, that, that can justify and intuitions that can't justify um, beliefs? Well, at least for phenomenal conservatism, any seeming uh, in absence of a defeater does just. So, I I mean I have a hard time making sense of that. Like I don't I don't really understand what it would mean to say that it's justified because you intuit it. Like, I mean, what what about you, Jack? Do you do you? Like, is there a clear way to to make sense of that, or are you also lost with that? What's what's your take? Well, as I was saying before, right? I I thought I was saying that I think seemings. No, maybe I wasn't saying this to you, uh, but somebody else. But uh, like, I don't think that I don't think seemings justify unless of a. Uh, an evidential type of inference. Uh, sorry, you cut out there. You don't. Sorry, think if seemings... I thought, I don't think seemings justify unless they're part of like some kind of evidential inference. So, for example, if I thought that the existence of trees implied that. Should I should I look in the direction of a tree, I would expect to see one or expect to have a seeming that there was something that there was a tree, right? Something that looked like a tree. If I expect to have a seeming of that, then I could say that having the seeming is confirmation of the hypothesis that there's a tree there because the tree hypothesis predicts the seeming, right? But that's to offer an inferential justification, right? And so that's clearly not what people seem to mean when they say that seemings justify. Um, they seem to think it justifies even without that inference, right? But I just don't see how a seeming raises the probability of a proposition being true mm -hmm. without the inference, right? Uh, so I the agree. idea is... The idea is that uh, I think we have this notion of justification in which uh, inference is uncontroversially justified, right? Like almost everybody will agree that deductive or inductive or abductive inferences, for example, all are justifiers, mm -hmm. right? So the proponent of non-inferential justification wants to say that those are just one type of justifier and seemings are another type of justifier. So they both share in this broader notion of justification, right, uh, which is somehow deeper. But the problem is if what it is that makes inferences justifiers that they increase the probability of a proposition being true and that's not true of seemings it's not clear to me why proponents of phenomenal conservatism aren't just changing the subject and talking about schmustification 
when they say that seemings justify, they're really saying, it seems like they're really saying seemings schmustify. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand why that's interesting. Right. So, Jack, just let me make sure I understand. So what you want them to do is either explain how seeming raises the probability of truth or admit that they're not talking about non-inferential justification. They're just talking about non-inferential schmustification. Yeah, that's right. What is the reply to that, Enzo? Yeah, well, I guess I'll take, like, the first horn, I guess, to kind of setting up a dilemma, right? So the question might, it might actually just be begging the question to say that, right? Because if you say, well, how do you know that this criterion, this foundational criterion that you have is producing true beliefs, you know, isn't that question just denying the very claim that a foundationalist makes, that there doesn't have to be inferences stretching back and back, that there can be foundational beliefs that are justified? You know, isn't that sort of just reasoning in a circle against the foundationalist? I was just saying that I took it that justification, that inferences are uncontroversially justifiers, right? And it seems like everybody would agree that how an inference justifies is through the fact that it raises the probability of the proposition that it's a justifier for. Proposition raises the probability of the... You cut out. Sorry. I, I take it that everybody is going to agree, all parties to the debate are going to agree that what it is in virtue of that inferences justify is that they raise the probability of the belief in it, that the proposition in question is true, right? Oh, well, wait, can people reject that? Uh, Aren't there different notions of justification, right? Reliable, reliableist notions, and then there's like deontological notions of justification. I don't, I don't really understand how that isn't going to involve probabilities, right? You're saying when you give an if when you give a justification, right? If it's an inductive or abductive one, right? You're giving an argument that some conclusion is more probable. Uh, some conclusion is most likely true, right? Or is likely true. Right, in virtue of the fact that uh, these premises are <clears throat> likely true, right, and there's some kind of um, valid inference rule being employed, right? Mm -hmm. So you're making an argument that some proposition is likely true, right? Uh, now, if you give a deductive argument and the assumption is that the propositions, uh, sorry, the premises are true, and that there's a valid inference rule being employed, right? It just follows that the belief should be taken to be true, because given those assumptions, there's uh, a probability of one, right, that the conclusion is true. Um, uh, and so... If you take all that away, if you take sort of like the probabilistic element away from justification, I just don't know what it is that people are talking about. Yeah, I mean, can someone say that they're coextensive, you know, justification and probability, but that they aren't the same thing, that these are different notions? I mean, you presumably you are, you are aware that there are, there are philosophers who say that, right, who will talk about, like, justification as a as a deontological thing, as a normative notion, not as a uh, naturalistic notion, right, having just to do with probabilities. Well, I'm not making an argument to naturalize justification. I don't think that anything that I said there is, um, commits me to any kind of naturalism. Right, but nonetheless, uh, you recognize that there are different ideas about justification. 
clearly there are different ideas about it. What I'm saying is, is that I think that it's uncontroversial. You kind of. Sorry, I, I. Um... You cut out again. <laughs> Sorry, I just take it as contra uncontroversial that inference is justified, and that how they do it is by increasing the probability that the belief that one is offering a justification for is true. So the question is, if non-inferential justification is indeed justification, how is it, if it doesn't actually, if either it's even must in some way increase the probability of the belief is true, then the question is, how does that work if it's not uh, part of some kind of like evidential uh, argument of the type that I sketched, right? If it doesn't do that, how does it do it? And if it doesn't do it, how is it justification at all rather than just changing the subject? Mm, okay. So, I mean, I guess I could uh, push back on what you said about justification, but yeah, that doesn't seem very interesting, so I'll just grant it. So what you're asking for, right, is a meta-justification. You're saying, well, why believe that this criterion of justification is actually doing any work, right? So you, you realize you're asking me for a meta-justification? I don't think so. Well, that sounded to me like what you were asking for. What were you asking for, then? I'm asking for an explanation for how it is that seemings, A, either increase the probability of um, a proposition being true, or if it doesn't, if it isn't taken to do that, how it's not talking about a different notion of justification and in fact, a mere change of subject, right? Which is to say, equivocating on the concept of justification. Yeah, well, let's just grant that they aren't talking about different things, right? And that they are talking about the same thing. Let's just, you know, we can just suppose that. So it, do, it did sound to me like what you were asking for there was a meta justification. You were saying, look, you believe seemings raise probability. Why believe that? What justifies that belief? No, I'm asking how it does it. How? Yeah, how do seemings raise the probability? Oh, it seems... Oh, I guess I don't know. Um, I don't have an account for that. Um, but then... I guess I don't understand. You're saying that... But I'm think... not sure I need one. Wait a minute, but... Aren't you saying something like, um, I think that seemings should be taken as justifiers because it seems like seemings? Um, well, there might be some kind of epistemic circularity, right? Or maybe not. I mean, I could also deny that. Well, how is it not circular? Well... No, we just start talking about like this idea of meta justification, right? We kind of think about how we solve that problem. So one option would be some kind of epistemic circularity, and I think that that actually is Hume's view, by the way. Um, but the other option, maybe there are other options, right? Maybe you could appeal to you know, particularism at this point. Either say that the criterion is a particular itself, or that it's inferred from um, other beliefs which are particulars. And that would be another option. Um, I guess I'm not seeing how that's an answer to the, to the question. So you're saying that you could deny that you ought to believe that seemings justify because it seems like they do. Someone could say that, yeah. Someone then, could think that there's epistemic circularity. Wait. No, I was saying... If you didn't think that the justification was circular, right, the question is, what actually is the justifier? 
Yeah, so maybe you could appeal to some kind of particularism. How does that work? Well, you might just say that the criterion is a particular. What particular is it? The, well, phenomenal conservatism, right? That proposition, you might say, yeah, that's a particular. Wait, but how? I don't see how that escapes. Well, why not? You asked for the meta justification. That's a meta justification. You, you, so, if I said, why should I think, right, that seemings are justifiers when I don't understand how seemings can do that, right? You, it sounded like you said, on the one hand, you could say that. Um, you could say it seems like they do. That would be one option. That seems circular, right? Yeah, that's epistemic circularity. Right. So now if you resisted the circularity, what's the other option? You could appeal to particularism. Okay, but I'm not understanding that. How, what what is do you it? know? Yeah, I think I know what it is, but well, I don't understand what is the justifying particular in, that's being well, invoked in this case. Well, I would say I don't know how the particular is justified. That's why it's a particular. Wait, but is it an appeal to the fact that it seems to be true or an appeal to something else? I don't know. It's a particular. I, do, I don't get it. Well, on the particularist view, you don't need to know how you know something in order to know. It sounds like you're just, no, but that's just, that's just appealing to some kind of external justification. No, no, it isn't. It's appealing to a justification that could be internal, right? It's just that you don't know what it is. How could it be internal if you don't know what it is? Well, because you could be aware of the thing that is justifying, but you wouldn't know that it is actually the justification. I don't understand. Well, look, I could be aware of uh, something in my experience, right? But I might not know. I might not have a higher order belief that that thing is my justification. Oh, I might not that's know external, that. But that's externalist justification. Is it? But it's a thing yeah. in the experience. It's a thing you're aware of. No, what, what it means for it to be externalist is that you don't have to have access right to how it justifies right so Even for instance like in the if it take like the chicken sexer case right the idea is that i might be able to say that you know there's some intuition right that um is what moves me to put the chicken in one um, in one group rather than the other, right? One sex group rather than the other, right? But <clears throat> I don't actually know the mechanism, the reliable mechanism, right, which explains that. But nonetheless, the reliable mechanism that explains it, right, is the justifier for the belief. That's that, that 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 chicken is male rather than female, right? That's externalist justification. Yeah, it's not something you're aware of. In, in the case I described, it's a thing in your experience, or it could be, right? No, the intuition that the chicken sexer has is in their experience, right? But the point is, they don't have access to the justifier. But nonetheless, what the externalist wants to say is they are justified by the operation of the mechanism. Well, wait, is the thing that's justifying them the reliable mechanism, or is it yeah. the intuition that they have? It's the reliable mechanism. Yeah, well, then it isn't something they're aware of, right? The intuition isn't really relevant, it's the mechanism. Well, the point is, it's because they have the intuition that they group, right, the, um, the chicken in one group rather than the other, right? Now, okay. that's... A, that's that's going to involve a belief, right? They're going to say, because of this intuition, I think that this, um, 
this um, chicken is male rather than female, right? Now okay, the so externalist. The yeah. Now the externalist. The, the externalist wants to say that even though they don't have access to the justifier, the belief is justified by the mechanism. Yeah, but they're not aware of the mechanism, right? It's not in their yeah, experience. Yeah, that's the whole point. That's why right, it's but externalist. On, on what I said, where there's actually something in your experience that's justifying the belief, you are aware of the thing. It's in your experience. You just don't know that it is your justification. Wait, but that's just phenomenal. No, no, it isn't. I thought that phenomenal conservatism was that because something seems to be true, it justifies the belief that it's true in the absence of the defeater. Yeah, that's PC. But that's not what I said. Right. So wait a minute. Is... You cut out. When you said there's something in the experience, that's a seeming, right? Um, yeah, I said that there's something in the experience, and that would be a seeming, but I didn't say that the seeming was the justifier. It could be right, so then the justifier is something external to the experience, right? No, it could be in the that... experience. Sorry, what's the justifier? I don't know. That's why it's a particular, right? Wait, I don't understand. You're saying that... You cut out. Either you have access to the justifier, in which case you're an externalist. I'm sorry, either you have access to the ju justifier, in which case you're an internalist, or you don't have access to it, in which case you're an externalist. Yeah, it will be either or. But, uh, yeah, so I mean, which is it? Well, I wouldn't. I don't know. Right? It's a particular, that's the point. I don't understand. I don't understand what's why saying it's a particular is relevant here. Well, because that's the whole point of the particularist view. They, they say they don't know, right? They don't have to know. I thought that the whole point of the particularist view was that there wasn't some generalization that could be made about it. Well, no, they still think you can make a generalization. They just think you can start with the belief and have knowledge without having a method. Without having a method. Yeah, they think knowledge comes first. Then you get your method from your knowledge. Okay, so what are we taking knowledge to be here? We can, just, justified belief, we can just go with JCB for, the, for a rough and ready definition. Right, okay, so you have a justified belief, right? So the question is, what's the justified? Well, if it's a particular, I wouldn't know. I, I might know once I've done more reasoning, right? Maybe like, maybe it's phenomenal conservatism, right? maybe it's something else. Yeah. Wait, but I, I don't think that what, if it's a particular, you wouldn't know. Well, maybe you would and maybe you wouldn't, but the point is, is that you don't have to know. If, look, if you're saying the belief is justified, right, either you have access to the justifier, in which case you're an externalist, or you don't have access. Sorry, either you have access to it, in which case you're an internalist, or you don't have access to it, right? In which mm -hmm. case you're an externalist, Okay. right? So that's one issue, externalism versus internalism, right? The other issue is whether the, in, whether the justifier is inferential versus non-inferential. Right? So there's two issues, right? Now, what I was saying, the way this started was by saying that I didn't understand, I didn't, that it seemed to me non-inferentialists uh, are up. You cut out. So the way this started was by saying that I think that um, proponents of non-inferential justification have a dilemma, right? Which is on the one hand, they give an account of how seemings can justify, right? Or alternatively, they explain um, they explain uh, how it is that they're 
not talking, not changing the subject when they talk about justification, right? Okay. So, I'm trying to remember now. So your so on the one hand, you said that. Cut out. On the so it said it seemed like on the one hand. You said it's so on the one hand. <laughs> you cut out. Know, sorry. On the one hand, you said they could, they could explain it, by saying that it seemed to be true, right? But that's just to appeal to phenomenal conservatism. To yeah, justify, that's episode, episode yeah, that's just to appeal to phenomenal conservatism to justify phenomenal conservatism. Right, but, but they would distinguish between benign circularity and malignant circularity, right? And they'd say that this is of a benign kind. Yeah, well, that I don't understand. But, but then you said that... Well, I just gave another option. They, Sorry? I just gave another option. I mean, I yeah, didn't understand said, it to either one. Right, I understand that. You said if they wanted to resist the circ if they wanted to resist a circular justification for phenomenal conservatism, right, they could offer some particularist um, justification. And that's what I didn't understand. Right. So I guess there's like two options within the particularist kind of take on this, right? That would be to say that phenomenal conservatism is itself a particular, or to say that it's inferred from other particulars. Um, and it and seemed so... like what, what you were wanting to know was, okay, well, what justifies that those beliefs? What justifies the particulars? Uh, well, no, I just don't understand what it is that you're appealing to there, right? So, well, do you, do you understand <clears throat> the particularist view? No, not in this context. Okay. Yeah, it's different from moral particularism. Yeah, no, I'm I'm aware that there's an, a distinction between particularism and methodism in epistemology, right? But I don't understand how you're deploying. Uh, well, I'm saying that uh, PC could itself be a particular, or that there be you know, other particulars that we have, right? Like maybe you know, the laws of logic are a particular or something. And that we reason looking down at those particulars and come to phenomenal conservatism. But I don't understand how that's an answer to the question. Well, you asked how they were justified. I, I, asked I, didn't how they understand were, the I didn't ask how they were justified. I asked how they were justifiers. Yeah, I just don't understand what you're asking for. Though. Well, what I said was, right, that it's uncontroversial that inferences justify in virtue of raising the probability of the proposition being true, right? So, if the proponent of phenomenal conservatism. You cut out. Proponent of phenomenal conservatism seems to me to have to deal with a dilemma, right? They either have to show how it is that seemings raise the probability of a proposition being true, right? Or they have to explain how they aren't changing the subject. When they talk about justification, when they're right, talking but we're just going, this. we're just going around in circles. I offered you the account. I don't think you have. I don't think you. Well, I think I did. <laughs> just repeat any, the question. Does anybody else? You want me to repeat the question? No, why don't we just, don't we just is, try one more time? The question is, how is it that seemings either raise the probability of a proposition being true? Or how is it that you're not changing the subject when you talk about justification if you're saying that they don't raise the probability of a proposition? Yeah, so, so let's just grant that I'm not changing the subject, right? We'll leave that okay. one off the table. Right. So how do seemings raise the probability yeah. of a proposition? So, that, so, there's a, so there's options here. Can I, I gave two. We could say 
that there's some kind of epistemic circularity and that this is a benign kind of circularity and that it's acceptable, right? Or we could appeal to epistemic particularism and we could say that the criterion is known because it's a particular or that it's known inferentially from other particulars. Yeah, I don't follow that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how else to put it. Like, maybe I'm just not understanding the question. Isaac, do you do you have a take? On can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, Jack, can you tell me your objection once clearly? Yeah, so I'm saying that all parties to the debate all parties to the debate agree that inferences justify. Yeah. And how how inferences justify is by raising the probability mm -hmm. of the belief in questions being true mm -hmm. that the um, justifiers are justifiers for, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what I don't understand about non-inferential justification is that it seems like either the proponent of non-inferential justification has to explain you cut out. Has to explain. It has to explain how mere seeming can raise the probability of a, mm -hmm. of a belief's being true, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it seems like the only way that that happens is if um, it's part of some kind of evidential argument, right, in which the seeming is expected given some hypothesis. Right. But that would but be that's, an inference. But that's clearly that would be an inference. So that's clearly not what they mean, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if in fact they don't say that inferences raise the probability of a, you cut out. Don't raise the possibility. Sorry, of, don't raise the probability of a belief being true. Mm -hmm. Then I don't see how they aren't changing the subject when they claim to be talking about justification. Okay, and okay, so I think that I understand what your objection is. I'll say it back and make sure that I've got it. So you're saying that if by justification we're talking about raising the probability of a belief being true, that yeah. when um, a proponent of non-inferential justification, uh, what, what you need them to do is give an account of how um, seemings raise the probability of a belief being true and if they uh, can't give that account but they're still insisting that um, seemings justify it seems like they're probably just equivocating on justify yes okay so the only part of that that I don't know if I agree with is the last bit about they must be um equivocating and talking about some other kind of justification he could still be saying that it provides um epistemic justification like it raises the probability but he might just be saying that he doesn't have access to how it raises the probability i think that's a crazy thing to say but he could be doing that and not equivocating he could just be not giving the account that you're expecting is that what you're no. doing in sub well i said that was an option okay um, but o overall, I think I understand Jack's point. So, so Insup, what, what are you, well, you can tell us what you think the options are here, but what are you doing? Are you trying to give an account of how seemings justify, or are you, uh, saying that seemings justify, uh, in a way that you don't have access to, or are you equivocating on justify? I'm pretty sure we can assume you're not equivocating on justify. Like you've been very clear you're talking about raising the probability of a belief, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, so it's not the third one. So are you giving an account of how seemings justify or are you saying that you don't have an account? Or are you saying both, maybe it's uh, so one of those possibilities, we can go down both of them? Yeah, well, I was just giving possibilities. I mean, I didn't ascend to either one. But we that, can that's just, okay, that's we can fine. We just talk about this. 
we can just by talking about uh, we can talk about this by talking about the concept of a meta justification, right? Which it seems to me is what is being asked of here. Wait, wait but but, but but just just one second. Sorry to cut you off, but just I understand that you're not committing to a pathway. You're saying that there's different strategies and you're not sure how they work out, so you don't want to commit to a particular one. Totally fine, understandable, but just before going into what you're about to go into just tell us what you're doing are you giving an explanation of how uh, seemings might justify or are you gonna give us um some explanation of how they justify but you don't know how they justify well, i'm just gonna lay out the options as i see them <clears throat> okay well which option are you giving us first an account of how uh, seemings justify yeah the account of how they do okay let's let's hear that one first right so like for the question of meta justification as to that question what well, what's being asked here is why believe okay wait sorry it? i need i need to i i'm really sorry to cut you off is we need to settle if asking for an account is the same thing as asking for a meta justification i think jack will object to that would you object to that oh, okay right do, do you mean something different jack i was asking for an explanation do yeah, but are you asking for the, right. the meta justification? Do you do you take explanation to be the same thing as meta justification? No, I don't think so. Okay, so in sub, why are they the same thing? Well, then, I, well, that's what I thought he meant. Now I actually don't know. What he, <laughs> I don't know what he's asking me now. What do you mean the explanation? I'm asking how it is that seemings <clears throat> raise the probability of a belief being true. Well, if that's true, it's a necessary truth, right? So there's there's nothing Why? to be explained. That's an, that's an incoherency. Wait a minute. Why, if it's true, is it a necessary truth? I don't understand that. Well, I think that that would be the only option, right, for kind of epistemic beliefs. Like, Wait, what's I don't see the how they argument could be for that? Wait a minute. That's not an argument. That's just appealing to... Oh, I don't know some kind of thing. argument on that. No, I don't have an argument on that for that. I was so just giving why you an. Say it? Because I was giving you an account. No, you just said. I asked. I asked. How is it that seemings raise the probability of a proposition? Yeah, and I was true? about to give you the account, and then you kind of. No, you said it. if that's true, it's necessarily. True. Yeah, that's part of that's the account, dude. I don't see how it's an answer to the question. Well, if it's if it's a necessary truth, then it couldn't be any other way, right? It's what what contradiction reason. what contradiction would it entail? No, it, it, it could just be, be broadly fun. it could just be broadly logically necessary. And Wait a minute, uh, I don't understand what that means. Well, you know that there are different types of necessities, right? I know that they're invoked, but I don't know what they mean. Uh, well, a thing that's broadly logically necessary is just anything that could be true, right? Anything that could exist. Wait, but what does it mean to say that it could be... If we're talking about broadly logical possibility, what does it mean that... Or let's say broadly logical necessity. What does it mean that it could be true, right? Well, let's say broadly logically impossible. What does it mean to say that it could not be true if its denial entails no contradiction? What does that mean? Well, that it couldn't be real, right? It could never exist. It could never be the In case. In virtue of what? I don't know if that question makes sense. Well, it just sounds like you're invoking some kind of brute necessity. Normally, I could say that something is impossible in virtue of the fact that its denial entails a contradiction. Right. Well, why does that make it impossible? Sorry? Why does that make it impossible? I thought that was the most fundamental notion. Yeah, but can I just ask the further question? No. <laughs> well, then I'm going to say no. I don't understand that. Well, I don't understand what you're saying either, right? If you're just going to say you no, do, I'm saying right? no. I think you no. do understand no, I... it. Yeah, well, you understand. Well, then I'm going <laughs> to... I'm just going to mirror you here, and I'm going to say I think you understand what I'm saying. No. The point is, right, it doesn't make sense to ask for a further justification for why something is false, uh, is necessarily false, if, um, 
it's a denial entails a contradiction. Why is that, Jack? Right? Sorry? Why is that? Because there isn't a broader notion of justification to appeal to. What right? about epistemic worlds, then? What does that have to do with it? The point well, is, isn't that a broader notion? The point is, right, that the broadest notion of necessity is going to be Sorry, yeah, the broadest notion of necessity is going to be um, conceptual necessity. Mm, we don't ask. Necessity. We don't ask a further. Well, that's something different. We don't ask a further question, right, about what justifies the claim that something is impossible um, if it entails a contradiction, right? Because that would just be to question the law of non-contradiction itself, right? I presume yeah, you agree that. There... Yeah, I okay. accept it. So but there, there are philosophers who reject that. Fine, a philosopher. You cannot. A philosopher who rejects it is just going to be asked the question, right? What notion of possibility are you appealing to when you say it's possible that the law of non-contradiction is false? Maybe epistemic possibility, right? I don't see what that has to do with it. Or isn't that another kind of possibility? It's not within the family of modalities that I'm invoking here, right? But isn't there an overlap? Yeah, there can be an overlap in the sense that we can say that given that we don't know uh, that a contradiction holds, that it appears to be epistemically possible. But once we knew that a contradiction held, we would understand that it was epistemically impossible, right? Well, wait a second, isn't that the very thing that a dialetheist rejects? A dialetheist is going to be asked, right, why, what notion of possibility they're offering sorry, are appealing to when they say that it's possible that the law of non-contradiction doesn't hold. Yeah, well, they have alternative logics, right? Or they could talk about epistemic possibility. I don't see what epistemic possibility has to do with it. Well, because then they're saying that it's possible that there exists a true contradiction, right? With respect what? to what we know, that that could exist. But I don't understand what that notion of possibility is. Well, you're just saying you find it unintelligible. Yeah, I find it unintelligible. Okay, well, the daily... Really... Well, that's, that's not an argument, John. Wait, I think there's a misunderstanding, Incep. It's not meant to be an argument. It, in, Incep, he's, he's saying that he doesn't... Um, like, if you're saying that there's that contradictions are possible he doesn't know what understanding of possible you're using because logical possibility is just usually defined as like the absence of a contradiction he's saying he doesn't know yeah, what that, that only so you just so... have to give an explanation of what you mean by possible if you want to say contradictions are possible because it can't fit what is normally meant by possible well look i don't want to say that they're possible Right, but just right, if but it, are... but this is the challenge. You you're trying to push back on him, you know, saying, uh, look, you're you're trying to push back on him with dialetheism, right? Dialetheism. So he is giving you a response to that, right? Which is to say he doesn't know what it means to say a contradiction is possible, right? Because um, uh, logical possibility just means the absence of a contradiction. So if someone wants to say that contradictions are possible, like even if you just want to deploy it as a devil's advocate position in a debate. And it has, you have to have some meaning of what possible means there to offer. He can't even make sense of it. Well, they have alternative logics, right? What do you mean by possible, though? Well, with respect to those alternative systems that don't explode with a contradiction. But what, what do you mean? What's possible actually mean, though? What does it mean? It yeah, means that like, it fit. Yeah, like, it means like, it doesn't what, if violate you, if the you rules ask, of the system. If you ask, wait, what? It doesn't violate the rules of that system. What it doesn't violate? Wait, but what? Okay, so your definition of possible. So we're not using the normal definition of possible, which is you know 
<laughs> not involving a contradiction. We're saying that possible is anything that functions within some system. So, I mean, I don't know if that's enough for you to go on, Jack. I'll probably just ask you what that system is or something. Because if you're claiming well, there's some I'm contradiction, so, some system where a contradiction is possible, whatever exactly that means, yeah. Well, I'm not familiar with you know, dialetheist philosophers, so I couldn't answer a question like that. But the point is, is that, yeah, there are people who would, uh, would ask a question, well, is it possible that there exists a true contradiction? They're called dialetheists. They're serious people. I mean, uh, I don't... What Jack was trying to say was that, you know, I was I was saying something, uh, I was saying that something was necessary, but that there was no explanation, or that, you know, I was appealing to some kind of a brute facts. But I think a similar thing could be said of other necessary truths that Jack accepts. Yeah. Well, I, it's hardly, I'm not sure why that's relevant if you actually think the law of non-contradiction holds, right? Well, I was just playing, the de I was playing devil's advocate, right? Well, it seems like a big waste of time to do that, right? Because the fact is, is you're not even accepting the objection that you're posing, right? So if, in fact, you're granting that um, logical impossibilities or necessities are not brute, right, then you need to offer an account of how metaphysical possibilities and necessities are not brute. And I just don't understand that. Well, I actually don't have an answer to that. I mean, maybe logical necessities are brute. Um, well, well, I don't know, I don't know but I just don't understand what that even means. Yeah, well, that's just saying you find it unintelligible, right? But that is a yeah, logical I find yeah. it unintelligible, yeah. It's not meant to be an argument, right? I'm simply saying I don't know what you're talking about when you say there's this thing that's metaphysically impossible, right? Because if I say in virtue of what, and you say in virtue of nothing, right? I don't understand what that means. Whereas if you say something is logically impossible, right? Uh, and I ask you why, and I demonstrate a contradiction, right? Or if I say that if that it would have to entail a contradiction, right? Therefore, it cannot be true, right? That's totally understandable to me. Because if you think the law of non-contradiction holds, right, it's just the case that there can't be true contradictions, right? So any contradiction is going to be necessarily false, right? There's nothing brute about that, right? But you're just saying for no reason at all, for no explanation at all, some things are somehow necessary, whatever that means, and I have no idea what it means, Right, that there's some subset of possible worlds, right, in the space of possible worlds that are logically possible, right, there's some narrower set of possibility, right, in which um, there are things that really are um, impossible, even though there's no explanation for why, because it's not the case that. Um, it would entail any contradiction for them to hold, right? Mm -hmm. Not in virtue. So what are you saying there? You just don't understand I, that idea? Yeah, I don't understand the idea. Now, for instance, if you were talking about nomological possibility or nomological necessity, right? I do understand that idea. That's a necessary Sorry, that's a notion of necessity that's narrower than logical necessity. But it's simply saying that given a certain set of laws, right, of natural laws, some things are impossible and some things are impossible, right? But then you can just say, yeah, but which nomological laws actually hold are brutally contingent facts, right? You can say they're brutally contingent facts, but... Nonetheless, given those brutally contingent facts, um, in worlds in which those laws hold, some things are going to be impossible and some things are going to be impossible. But I don't okay. understand what this intermediate notion is, right? It just seems to be saying that it just seems to be something purely arbitrary, right? Like I could make up my own type of necessity. Let's call it T-Rex necessity. Right, and I could say T Rex 
worlds are necessary for every world in which there's a T-Rex, right? And in worlds where there's no T-Rex, right, those worlds are T-Rex impossible, right? So the space of T-Rex possible worlds is the space of worlds in which T-Rexes exist, right? Um, now, I just don't see, that seems to be purely arbitrary to invoke T-Rex necessity and T-Rex possibility. And I'm just not seeing how metaphysical possibility is any different from that. Well, I think it would be kind of strange, right, to invoke T-Rex possibility, but I understood it. Um, you know, I understood. Yeah, but said. the point is that you understood that it was an arbitrary stipulation of some set of worlds as being possible and impossible relative to whether they have T-Rexes in them or not, right? Yeah. But I take it that when you invoke metaphysical possibility, you're not saying that it's some arbitrary space of possibility and impossibility, right? That there's some kind of principle basis to it, right? That it's not merely a brute fact. Yeah, well, I guess I don't have a view on that. I mean, it could be a brute fact, or um, maybe there is some explanation for why some things are metaphysically necessary and why some aren't. Um, explanation in virtue of what? Well, that was, well, I wouldn't know. I mean, it could be that there's no explanation, that this is just sort of brute fact. I, I don't understand what they would be, what it could be an explanation in virtue of if it was not in virtue of there being some logical entailment, in which case metaphysical possibility would collapse into logical possibility, right? Yeah, well, I wasn't putting anything affirmative on the table there. No, I'm just laying out some Well, you were, really... you were, in fact, saying that the two are distinct, right? So that's not going to be an option for you. Yeah, so why can the two just be distinct, but there be um, no explanation for why they're distinct? But... That's just or that there be an explanation that's that, unknown. What, how is that different from T-Rex impossibility? Well, I didn't see a problem with T-Rex impossibility. It's, I just wouldn't use that notion because I don't see a reason to. I but guess if, I don't. I guess I don't understand. Well, look. Suppose that there was some reason for us to start uh, us to start talking about T-Rex necessity and T-Rex impossibility. Then I wouldn't see a problem with using that notion. That could be very useful. Right, we, we want to talk about things that could exist and things that couldn't exist. So, you know, in order to do that, we might want to talk about this restricted notion of possibility. I, I, I possibility. don't, I don't understand. Right, when you say that seemings necessarily justify, but you cut up. When you say seemings necessarily justify. But that's not a conceptual necessity, right? I don't understand why that would be a notion that should interest us in any way if it's merely some arbitrary notion of necessity, like T. Rex necessity. Why is it interesting to invoke? Well, because it helps us answer your question. How no, is it, it doesn't is answer the question at all. Well, hang on. I mean, if if. Uh seemings necessarily raise the probability of the belief, right? That would answer the question. Then we'd have an account. I don't understand what you mean by necessary there. You just it, seem like it, it means, it just seems like you mean that in worlds in which they do justify, they do. And in worlds in which they don't, they don't. But they don't necessarily justify. I mean, even by because of the possibility of defeaters means that they don't necessarily... No, justify. I mean in absence of a defeater, right? In absence of a defeater, they would necessarily... Yeah, but I'm justify. saying uh, because of the possibility of uh, defeaters, it shows that they don't necessarily justify. The whole point of necessity is that they, they uh, justify irrespective of the conditions. But if the condition is that you have... Look, you don't say something like 2 plus 2 is logically necessary, in, uh, 2 plus 2 equaling 4 is logically necessary unless you have a defeater for that. You just say it's necessary. You know? Like, <laughs> there's not more to it. 
And that's the same thing with this. That they're just not necessarily justifiers. That's the whole point. Well, look, the proposition is seemings justify an absence of a defeater, right? And then I said, okay, well, that could be a necessary truth. Or in fact, I, I, uh, I said it was a necessary truth, right? So why couldn't that be necessary in this restricted sense? That in all the realizable worlds, right, in all the worlds that anyone could ever find themselves in, that would be true. Well, it's not all the worlds that anyone can find themselves in. It's the world in which everyone can find themselves in, in which seemings justify. Well, it's the worlds in which... Um, because that's how you've defined it. Well, right? I said that these that's are worlds... How you're defining, that's how you're defining metaphysical necessity, right? It's an arbitrary subspace within the space of possible worlds. So when you say it's metaphysically necessary, you just mean the worlds in which it necessarily justifies, right? Well, I define that's that's just fair. arbitrary. That's just arbitrarily excluding the worlds in which they don't justify. Just like when I talk about T Rex necessary, right? If I say that world is impossible according to T Rex necessity because t-rex necessary worlds are the ones in which because <clears throat> t-rex necessary worlds are worlds in which the only possible worlds are worlds in which there are t-rexes right i'm just excluding the worlds in which there are no t-rexes and i'm saying they're impossible worlds by which i just mean they're t-rex impossible worlds that's just ludicrous right so when you say that you can appeal to the notion of t-rex necessity to justify metaphysical necessity you're just saying you can arbitrarily you cut out you're just when you say you can appeal to t-rex necessity to justify the notion of metaphysical necessity you're just saying that you can arbitrarily exclude the worlds in which seemings don't justify for no reason at all there's no logical incongruity right, in a world of worlds in which seemings don't justify. You're just arbitrarily excluding them, right, by defining the notion of metaphysical necessity relative, right, to this concept. How is that not ludicrous? Well, I think that that's a little for sale, right? I mean, that's a broadly logically possible, broadly logically uh, logical possibility is normally defined in terms of what's existible, right, or could exist. Again. Again, T. You cut out. T Rex. You. T Rex impossible. T Rex impossible worlds cannot exist. They are T Rex impossible, right? Now, if you say, "Oh, well, that's not genuine. That's not some genuine criterion for existence and non-existence, right? Because you're just arbitrarily excluding a set of worlds." right, um, that really can exist and just saying that they can't exist, right? Well, I don't see how that doesn't apply to metaphysical necessity. Because if I say, well, why do you, in virtue of what can they not exist, right? And you can't appeal to the fact that they, um, it, it entails a contradiction. It would entail a contradiction for them to exist, right? You can't appeal to that in this case. How is it that that's not any more arbitrary than the T-Rex case? Well, because when I say that this is an existable world, I don't just mean a world that can exist for the principle. I mean any world that could exist, right, with respect exist, to anything. Ex exist in virtue of what? Or not exist in virtue of what? In virtue of yeah. nothing? So... <laughs> So there are so there are two options, right? Could be that this is a brute fact, right? Again, or... I don't understand what it means for there to be brute necessities. How is that not saying that T? How is that just not the same thing as saying that T Rex worlds are impossible as a brute fact? Well, they are impossible for T Rexes, right? T Rexes can't yeah, exist. Yeah, so world. you're just saying the same thing. Metaphysically impossible worlds, right? Are, met are impossible uh, in the metaphysical sense of impossibility, but not in any other sense. 
No, I think that that's a little for sale, right? This is relative to whatever could exist. Don't you think that that's Again, an important Again, when sense? you say could, when you say could there, you just mean metaphysically impossible or metaphysically possible, right? So you're just invoking the notion you're trying to explain in the explanation. What does could mean there? When I say, when you say, metaphysically impossible, metaphysically possible worlds are the ones that could exist, right? What's the could there? You mean metaphysically possible? So metaphysically possible worlds are the ones that are metaphysically possible? That's what you're saying? What's the could there? When you say could. Yeah, that's definitely a semantic problem. Do you mean that they're fed metaphysically possible? Because I don't see how that's an explanation. Jack, Jack calm, down, say, calm down. There's no need to calm get heated. Down, calm down that you're such a fucking dishonest piece of shit, right? That you can't even acknowledge that you don't have an answer to the fucking objection, you I fucking don't have an piece of shit. Yeah. I don't have an listen, answer to that. Here's the, here's the objection, dumbass, right? Okay. Dude. I'm pointing out, I'm pointing out, right, that to say metaphysically possible right, refers to what could exist, right, is just to say that metaphysically possible, right, refers to what's metaphysically possible. And that's an absence of an explanation, you fucking dumbass, right? Okay. Now, have you, don't have, it, you yeah. don't have the fucking honesty. I am being honest. You've raised a very good objection. I don't know how to respond. I'm going to look into it. Great. Why are you saying that I'm being dishonest? Because I believe you are. But, but I just granted what you said. <laughs> you granted it when I started to get irate, right? But you were willing to pay, play these ridiculous games, right? As long as you could stretch it out. Well, I think that that's kind of uncharitable, right? Yeah. Why not just think, why not just think that I didn't understand what you were saying? That would be more charitable. Because I think that you're engaged in motivated reasoning. Okay, dude. Well, I mean, I can't, uh, I can't refute that. Okay. But yeah, I'll definitely look into what you said. It's very interesting. It's a good objection. Okay. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to bed. Sorry that got heated, I guess, guys. But good talking to you all. Have a good night.